My name is Dave Nave. Russell A. Koff brought new insights into managing the interactions between the parts of a company rather than managing the behavior of each part individually. He called this approach systems thinking, and his insights are a tremendous contribution to business and society. On behalf of the Deming Cooperative, we are pleased to make these videos available to you for your continued learning. Good morning. I am very suspicious of an audience that applauds a speaker before he has spoken. Uh, I should explain, uh, a number of years ago I was in the Soviet Union and uh, I was told a story by my host uh, about uh, Gorbachev, who was at that time the head of the country. He said Gorbachev noted that the members of the Central Committee of the Communist Party were doing a lot of political infighting, backbiting, not getting along well, no collaboration. He was very discouraged. He decided they were overworked, they needed a holiday. So he asked them to spend three days with him in his summer home in the Crimea Mountains. And of course they all accepted. At the appropriate time, all these little fat men got into the vehicle and were driven to the Crimea and they no sooner got there when it started to pour. It rained continuously for two days, they couldn't get out of the house, and the tempers were just flaring. So Gorbachev had a bright idea. He called a nearby military base. He said, the forecast for tomorrow is good, we're gonna have sun. I'd like to have a balloon on the front lawn in the morning this big enough to carry the committee so we can take a trip over the mountains, which are beautiful. And the next morning, the sun was out, the balloon was there, and all the little fat men climbed in, including Gorbachev and they took off. They were about 2,000 feet over the Crimea having a marvelous time. When the pilot broke in, he said, gentlemen, I'm sorry to announce we have a slow leak. He said, in order to descend safely, I have to get rid of some weight. So I suggest that each of you grab a hold of the metal ring around the bottom of the balloon from which the basket is suspended. Put your arms around and hold very tightly, and I will pull a cord and drop the basket, and that should allow us to descend safely. So these very frightened men all grabbed a hold and held on for dear life. After a moment or two, the pilot said, unfortunately, that's not enough. We need another 200 pounds. Well, there was silence, and finally Gorbachev said, well, I've reached the pinnacle, I can't go any further. I'm the oldest one in the group, so I will go. And they all applauded. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since then, I see the audience disappearing on me. <laughs> uh, you've all got notepads and pencils. Forget about that stuff. They're going to give you copies of it. But that's not the real point. After a similar lecture a while back, one of the members came up to me and said, great lecture, he said. Contains a lot more than you know. <laughs> oh, besides... There's a lot more of what I don't know in the books. You can get that later, so take your uh, time and relax, and I hope you'll participate. Because it may be difficult for you to believe, but I've heard all this before. <laughs> so you may not have, so I'd like to get your opinion. Uh, I, well, last time I was here, I told a story about students who are really wonderful. They force a professor to confront reality, which is something they seldom have to do. This student stopped me in the hall one day. He said, uh, Professor, he said, how long have you been teaching? When did you teach your first class? I said, that's easy. That was September of 1941. Wow, he said. You men say you've been teaching more than half a century. I said, yeah. He said, incredible. He said, what's the last time you taught a course in a subject which existed when you were a student? Now, that's a wonderful question I never thought of before. And after a pause for a moment, I said, I can remember. It was September of 1951 when I moved from Wayne to Case Institute. He said, you mean to say that everything you've taught since 1951, you've had to learn? I said, yeah. He said, you must be a pretty good learner. I modestly agree. 
He said, what a pity you're not that good a teacher. <laughs> uh, see, he had it right. What the faculty knows how to do is learn, not teach. And as everybody knows who's ever taught, the one who learns the most in the class is the teacher. And schools are upside down. Students ought to be teaching, because that's the way to learn, whereas the faculty ought to be learning, because that's what they know how to do. So today is not an, an effort to teach you, but I hope to motivate you into looking into some very important issues affecting management. The theme is really up here on the board, this quotation from Gelb, it's now a decade old, that we are entering a new age. And that's no longer just a literary figure of speech. Uh, all sorts of authors have picked this up. We're in the early stages, so we don't have a name for it yet. Drucker called it the age of uncertainty. Some call it the post-industrial revolution, the information age. Rifkin calls it the age of access. I prefer to call it the systems age because the concept of systems was central in the intellectual revolution that brought about the age. But let's look here. What we want to do is ask the question, uh, how do you convert an organization from operating well in the old age to operating well in the new age? Because if it doesn't make the transformation, it's not going to survive. Now, I can tell you, I've told this to literally thousands of executives, and they look at me and smile. You know, what a stupid thing to say. Look at the successful economy we have. How do you explain all that success if we're still operating in an old age and haven't made the adapt ad adaptation? Do you know what the average life of an American corporation is? 11 and a half years. It takes 23 new corporations every year for one that will survive the first year. Okay? Over 50% of the corporations in the Fortune 500 list 25 years ago don't exist anymore. The Dow Index, which consists of the average value of the blue uh, chip stocks, only contains one of the original corporations that was in it when it was started, because all the others have disappeared. We're terrible, but we're still the best. I didn't understand that, but I did finally when a professor explained it to me. He asked the class one day, what's the evidence that we have the best economy in the world? And all, all of us smart ass students, you know, we knew the answer, the highest GMP per capita, the highest consumption, gave all the usual economic statistics. He kept saying, no, 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 no. Finally, he said, there's no country in the world that could survive as much inefficiency as ours. Well, that's a hell of a good criterion, you come to think of it. But it's also very hopeful. If we can be the best with 22 failures for every success, suppose we could pull it down to 15 failures for every success. What would happen to our economy? The possibility for improvement is huge, but the improvement requires a transformation of a corporation from a mindset that characterizes the age we're coming out of to the age we're going into. And we're not going to have a name for it that we agreed to for a while. I just learned recently from a medieval scholar, he said, when do you think the word Renaissance was first applied to the 200 years that we all know as the Renaissance? I said, well, it must have been recognized when they were in it. He said, no, no, no. He said, People were not going around and say, hey, we're in the Renaissance. <laughs> It was 1850, 200 years after the Renaissance was over when somebody decided to name it. So we don't know what this new era is going to be called, but we know what its characteristics are. And we have some idea of what is required. So we want to look at two things. What is leadership? And what's a transformation from one age into the other? And that's basically the program for a day. What are the characteristics of the new era? And what does entry into it entail? Leadership and management are not the same thing, and neither is the same as administration. I get furious at all these programs around that are leadership development programs. I've yet to see one that is. 
They're management development programs. They're not leadership development programs. The people that, uh, that pretend that it's leadership are intellectual con men for a reason that's perfectly obvious when you reflect on it. You cannot teach leadership. You can do something about leadership, but you can't teach it for reasons that I'm going to come to in a moment. But first look at the difference between these three. Administration is the direction of others in the pursuit of objectives by the use of means that a third party selects. So the supervisor or a group of clerks are doing accounts receivable or payroll checks. He's not managing, he's supervising a group of people doing things which have been specified by an authority that passes down the directions to him of what they want done. A manager is someone who directs others in the pursuit of ends by the use of means that he selects. So it's his desires that dictate what people do, not a third party's. But a leader is someone who leads people in the pursuit of ends by the use of means that they either select or approve of. And that distinction is absolutely fundamental. There are lots of managers, but there are relatively few leaders. Leadership is a subject that's much discussed, but not too many people have thrown light on it. The best book on leadership I've ever come across is a little paperback written by John Carlson, who was the CEO of SAS Airlines who took it over and converted it from a bankrupt corporation to the most profitable airline in the world. This was about a decade ago. And he wrote this wonderful little book called Moments of Truth when he retired. And he had this to say, leadership has two main functions. One is to see the vision and develop the strategies that lead towards it. That vision has to be jointly formulated and subscribed to by the heads of the different units. And the other is to create an environment which makes it possible to implement the strategies. So develop a vision that will commit people to its pursuit, even though sacrifice is required, and develop an environment and a concept of how to pursue it that looks realistic enough to promise rewards. So a vision ought to be for an organization what the Holy Grail was for the Crusades. And it has to be something that will move the entire organization, not just management. In effect, as Carl Sahn said, it has to be a source of inspiration and excitement that attracts dedication. Now, how do we get one? Well, oh, let me get back here. I hit the wrong button. Yep. So another quotation by a remarkable man, a Spanish philosopher, Jose Ortega y Gasset, who was excommunicated from Spain when Franco took power. And when Franco was finally uh, gone, he was invited back, gave a series of lectures at the Madrid University, and his students took copious notes and published those lectures in prose in a little book called Mission of a University. It's a remarkable book because what de Gossett did was take every major revolution in the history of man and try to find what caused it, what was the source of the revolution. And he decided it's always something he called a mobilizing idea. And in this brief quote, he defines what he means by a mobilizing idea. See, man has been able to grow enthusiastic over his vision of unconvincing enterprises. He has put himself to work for the sake of an idea, seeking by magnificent exertions to arrive at the incredible. And in the end, he has arrived there. Beyond all doubt, it's one of the vital sources of man's power to be thus able to kindle enthusiasm from the mere glimmer of something improbable, difficult, and remote. If it's not improbable, difficult, and remote, it's probably not a vision. How do we get this kind of a vision for a corporation? Well, we have to do it in a way which brings the will of others in consonance with that of the leader. Because a leader is not going to take followers where he doesn't want to go. But he has to take them where he and they both want to go. We continually use the term leader for people who've been very effective in the role of command and control. 
So there's George Patton was a, an example. He wasn't a leader, he was a commander. A leader produces vol, uh, uh, vol voluntary followers, not by compulsion. Command and control is to get followers by the threat of punishment if you don't succeed. But if you look leaders in the eye, like Churchill or Roosevelt, or even Hitler and Mussolini, because leaders don't have to be good, they got people who wanted to follow them. They didn't necessarily compel them to, as command and controllers do. So an inspiring, inspiring formulation of a vision can produce that kind of agreement of wills among others. And inspiration is not the same as persuasion. It's a big difference. Because it produces a willingness to make short-term sacrifices for long-term gains. This thing has gotten extremely sensitive. For some reason, it changes when I don't touch it. <laughs> Must be telepathy. A very effective way of formulating an inspiring vision is by a process that was originally developed at Bell Telephone Laboratories and has since been expanded. It's called idealized redesign. Uh, this is a process which I believe when I was here last year I spoke about briefly, so I want to do so again briefly here. This process begins by taking the organization involved and assuming it was destroyed last night. It no longer exists, but its environment remains the same. Now you have to design an organization that takes its place. And you have only two minor constraints in doing that. One is the design you come up with must be technologically feasible. That means no science fiction. It can only employ knowledge that we currently have. When I first uh, came across this at Bell Labs, the vice president who was putting out the exercise explained, he said, you can't use mental telepathy to replace the telephone. He said, I don't want to argue whether it exists or not, but we don't know how to connect any two people selected at random by telepathy, so you can't use it. But in 1951, before communication satellites existed, he said to the group assembled, you can use a communication satellite because we're working on it, and we know that it's possible. It doesn't require any knowledge that we don't have. So the design must be technologically feasible. The second requirement is that it must be operationally viable. That means it must be capable of surviving in the current environment if we're brought into existence. But it doesn't mean it is capable of being brought into existence. That's not a requirement because it's going to be improbable and inspirational. It may be unattainable, but it must be approachable. Progress towards it must be there. That's why it's called ideal. An ideal is an objective that you can pursue, get closer to all the time, but never reach it. So the idea is very simple in mathematics. If you start with the number one and divide it by half, you get a series. One, one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth. You never reach zero, but you get closer and closer to it. And the pursuit of an ideal ought to be very much the same thing. So the two requirements are that the design you produce must be technologically feasible and operationally viable. Now, in addition, when an organization is involved, you're dealing with people, and the system must be designed so it's capable of being improved with time, with experience, and through learning. And so it must be flexible, ready, willing, and able to learn. Now, by sheer chance, I happened to be at Bell Labs when the first exercise of this type uh, was started. This vice president came into a group of approximately 40 section heads and said to him, we're going to assume the telephone system of, uh, that currently exists was destroyed last night. He said, obviously it wasn't, but there's a reason I'm asking you to assume that it was. He said, in the last issue of the Scientific American, 
There was an article which claimed that the Bell Telephone Laboratories are the best industrially based R&D laboratories in the world. He said, I believe that. And he said to the room, is there anybody in the room who doesn't believe it? Now, since they're all Bell Lab employees, obviously nobody disagreed. He said, good. He reached in his pocket and pulled out a sheet of paper covered with handwriting, which we couldn't read. He said, it occurred to me to make a list of the contributions we've made to the development of telephone that is responsible for that reputation. He said, before I share my list with you, I'd like to have your opinion. What do you think are the major things we've done for the telephone? And almost every hand in the room went up. He called on one fellow at random. He said, the dial. He said, right. He said, that's certainly one of the most important. He said, when did we introduce the dial? And somebody knew. It was in the early 1930s. When did we develop it? Nobody knew. He said, I looked that up. He said, much to my surprise, it was before 1900. He said, all right, let's take another one. The second one's thrown out since I was a visitor. I didn't know what they were talking about. Somebody said multiplexing. I later learned that multiplexing is a way of sampling sound so you can send six telephone conversations across the same wire at the same time. It increased the capacity of AT&T by 600%. He said, right, that's certainly one of the most important ones. When did we introduce it? Somebody knew. It was in the 1930s. When did we invent it? Nobody knew. He said, I looked that up too, and it was before 1900. Let's take one more, he said. The third one thrown out was the coaxial cable connecting the United States and Britain. He said, good, you now got the first, same first three I've got. He said, when did we build that cable? And somebody knew, 1882. He said, now, gentlemen, doesn't it strike you as odd that the three major contributions this laboratory has ever made to the telephone were all made before anybody in this room was born? What the hell have you been doing, he said. <laughs> and then he announced a basic system principle, which is incredibly important. He said, you've been looking at the parts taken separately and improving them, but you haven't affected the system one damn bit. You see, when you improve the parts of a system, you do not necessarily improve the whole, and you may destroy it by making the parts better. If you don't believe me, try to put a Rolls-Royce motor in a Hyundai. It's a better motor, but will you get a better car? Of course not, because the car isn't designed to operate with that kind of motor. Performance of a system depends on how the parts interact, not on how they act taken separately. So, he said, the fault in what we've been doing is mine, because I've been encouraging you to improve the parts taken separately. He said, that's wrong, so we're going to change that approach. We're not going to work from the parts to the system, but from the system to the parts. How? By redesigning the system and deriving the property of the parts from the design of the whole. Now, there's only one profession that does that. They do it completely unconsciously, so I have to ask your indulgence by not revealing what I'm about to tell you to them. Because if you do and they become conscious of it, they may stop doing it. And that's architecture. I used to be an architect before I was saved. And <laughs> a family came in one day shortly after I started to practice in an office and showed me a lot that they had bought out in the country, a beautiful lot on the side of a hill leading down to a creek at the bottom. They wanted to build a house into the side of the hill, enter from the upper level, and but have an entrance also at the lower level. One of the living quarters up top would have a living room, dining room, kitchen, all in one big open area, three bedrooms with two baths, a powder room, and a utility room for the laundry. Down below, they wanted a big room to hold parties and for the kids to play in. Uh, also a studio for the master of the house to work in that could double as a guest room with a bath, a utility room for the furnace and so on, a two-car garage with a do-it-yourself workshop at the back. They wanted contemporary architecture, and they told me approximately how much they wanted to spend. When all that was done, I asked them to give me a week and come back, and I'd have some sketches ready for them. Did you ever watch what an architect does? How does he start? Does he draw a sketch of each of the rooms and say, how do I put them together into a house? No. What does he do? 
He draws a picture of the house without any rooms in it. He draws a picture of the hole that has no parts. And then he puts rooms in it. Now he looks at the parts. He says, this bedroom is terrible. It's too long and narrow, and it doesn't have cross ventilation, so I'm going to have to change this room. And now he employs a criterion which shows unconsciously an understanding of systems as virtually no manager has. The criterion he employs in changing the room is not, is the room better? The criterion is, is the house better? And even if changing the room makes it worse, but the house better, he will do it. I have yet to see a manager who says to a management of a division or a department, next year we want you to behave less well so the corporation does better. Have you ever heard a manager say that? I never have. Unconsciously, in the retail business, people do that when they have called what they call lost leaders. They bring you into a store to buy something, they'll sell you at a loss because they hope it will attract you to buy the things that are profitable. I had a remarkable experience with that first house. After it was designed, the housewife called me one day before construction began. The contracts had been let on the house. She said, Russ, I can't wait till that house is built. I want to move into it so badly it hurts. But I am worried about one thing. She said, the playroom, the party room is down the lower level. The dining room and kitchen are up above it. That means I'm going to be running up and down the stairs all the time when we have company to get drinks and hors d'oeuvres, or when the kids are down there to bring down milk and cookies or to break up a fight. She said, can't we put a dumb waiter in? I said, sure, we can put a dumb waiter in. But we'll have to take space out of the kitchen to do it so it'll make the kitchen harder to work in. She said, I don't care, I want a dumb waiter. Now she got it, but look what she did. She made the kitchen worse, but the house better. Well, that's what this fellow at Bell Labs recognized. That what you have to do is start with the whole, then evaluate manipulation of the parts in terms of their effect on the whole, not their effect on the part taken separately. I wound up on a team of seven. He broke up the group into six sub-teams, gave each sub-team a subsystem. One had what's called uh, long, long line, that's between city communication. One had short line within city communication. One had the switching stations. I happened to be in the back of the room, so I got on the last team, which had the telephone set to redesign. Uh, shortly after the meeting ended, the group got together, and I was the only one in the room who was not an employee of Bell Labs, and the other members of the team thought this was funny, wanted to know how I snuck in. Uh, but they said he hadn't precluded the use of outsiders, so I was welcome to participate with the team. Unfortunately, I spent most of the next year working with that team rather than back at my job at Case Institute. But what an experience it was. Let me just briefly describe to you what happened. When we met for the first time, we said, we've got to design this telephone set. Why don't we make a list of all the things that are wrong with the telephone? then see if we can design a phone that eliminates those deficiencies. And somebody else sensibly said, that's a terrible way of going about it. And we were a little shocked, we said, why? And then I heard one of the most important system principles there is, that it's so completely obvious that everybody ignores it. When you get rid of what you don't want, you do not necessarily get what you do want, and you may get something much worse. It's that simple. Anybody who turns on a television set knows that. How many times do you get a program you want when you turn on a television set? You probably haven't calculated it. I have. <laughs> Point oh one. One out of a hundred times. It's very easy to get rid of. All I have to do is turn the channel. What's the probability I'll get a program I want? Still point oh one. Which means I got a virtually 50-50 chance of getting something I want less. You see. You can improve a part and make the whole worse. So we said, well, if we don't try to get rid of what's wrong with the telephone, what do we do? And somebody said, look, you forget the system doesn't exist anymore. Suppose we really were starting from scratch to develop a telephone system. 
what would we do? Well, we'd make a list of the properties we want to telephone to have, not the properties we don't want it to have. Well, that sounded like a reasonable idea, so we started. First one that went up, the volunteer was, no wrong numbers. Every call I receive should be intended for me. The second one was, I want to know who's calling before I answer the phone. Obvious. Third one, I want to know, I want to use the phone with no hands. The fourth one was great. Somebody said, I don't want to go to the phone, I want the phone to come to me, wherever I am. We went on for three weeks and had 92 properties we wanted a telephone to have. They got very complicated. We ran dry. So we said, what do we do now? Well, we haven't designed anything. We just have a list of the properties we want. So why don't we start with the first item, no wrong numbers. Now here I made a terrible mistake which destroyed my credibility in the group. I was teaching a course in logic at Case Institute on my occasional visits back there. So I pointed out there are two kinds of wrong numbers. One is when you got the right number in your head and dial it incorrectly. And the other is when you have the wrong number in your head and you dial it correctly. One of the groups said, yeah, but suppose you got the wrong number in your head, dial it incorrectly and get the right number. <laughs> well, fortunately, they decided that's very unlikely. So my reputation was partially saved, especially when they agreed that the distinction between the two kinds of wrong numbers is very important. How do we find out what percentage of wrong numbers of each type? Well, here I did know something useful. I knew the head of the psychology department of the Bell Labs, Dr. Samuel Carlin, so I got him on the phone that was in the room. And after the amenities, I said, Sam, have you ever done any work on wrong numbers? And he exploded. For the next couple of minutes, I couldn't understand him. He was so excited. He finally calmed down. It turned out he'd been doing research on wrong numbers for 17 years, and I was the first one to ask him about it. <laughs> so I finally got what I wanted to know. 80% of the wrong numbers are the incorrect dialing of the right number in your head. This is 1951 when they were all dials. So he said, okay, let's go to work on that. Now, the incredible thing that happened was in 30 minutes, we figured out how to eliminate dialing the wrong number. Now, what we did is we took the dial off the telephone, and in its place, we put something which did not exist in 1951, a handheld computer, calculator. So I have a picture of it. You have a register with 10 keys, one for each digit, and we had a red key in the corner. We said, you come to this phone, you do not lift the receiver off the hook, you leave it on. You put the number in by pushing the buttons, but the number you put in shows in the register. Now you look at the register, if it's right, you pick up the receiver and the whole number will go through at once. If it's wrong, you hit the red button, clear the phone and do it over again. And that would virtually eliminate the incorrect dialing of the right number in your head. There's a question. Could we do it? Is it technologically feasible? We didn't know. So we called a department of Bell Labs called Microminiaturization. And they sent two young experts down who listened to our explanation of what we wanted to do, increasingly whispering to each other rudely. But we're used to rudeness in an R&D laboratory. So we patiently continued until they got up and walked out with no explanation. In a hurry, we were furious, but we weren't gonna let them know they're not that important to us, so we went on to something else. About three weeks later, they came back in, looking sheepish and apologetic, and said, you probably wondered what happened the last time we were here. We said that was the understatement of the month. They said, what you're doing is fascinating, but not for the reasons that you are excited about. That wrong number stuff isn't interesting, but those buttons are. We went back and we built a telephone with push buttons and we tested it on 2,000 people, they said. Do you know that it takes 12 seconds less to put seven digits in a phone by pushing buttons and by turning a dial? And furthermore, if you do that before you're online, as your phone does, because you don't get online to lift the receiver, you get a 20 second advantage. That is enough to increase the capacity of the telephone system by almost one fifth. And they gave us the millions of dollars that was worth. 
He said, so we started a project over in engineering to build that push-button telephone, and we'd given it a code name. They looked around to make sure nobody was listening, and they gave us the name, Touchtone. That's where the Touchtone telephone came from. Now, you, anybody here got a mobile phone in their hand? Got one here? If you hold it up, there's the phone. You see? It's got the computer on the face of it, yeah. And it shows you the number. You don't lift the receiver until you're sure the number is right. Then you hit the activate button, right? It puts you online. If it's wrong, you hit a clear button. It goes with you wherever you go. It's got call forwarding, all the other stuff that we had in the design. Every change except one that has occurred since 1953, the telephone came out of that project, done in 51 and 52. That's how how ab absolutely uh, uh, encompassing it was, what an impact it had on that corporation. The one thing we did not envision was taking pictures with the telephone. That's something that came later. We did not hit that, but every other one uh, we had, the automatic redialing, the call forwarding, all that stuff, voice, mail, and so on. So this process called idealized redesign is a way of producing a vision that absolutely grabs the people who engage in it in a commitment to pursue it. And so Bell Labs has been pursuing it for over 50 years now. Who should participate in the preparation of such a design? As many of the stakeholders as possible or their representatives. The stakers, stakeholders, anyone who will be affected by the design, and of course, this includes people who can't be there because it may include future generations. I may do something that's going to affect the future and who's going to represent them. They have to be represented. You have to take the future into account. Now, take a big company like yours or General Electric, which has over 100 million customers and the customer is a very important stakeholder. What in the world do we do about them? How do you get them represented? Well, the largest one I've ever worked in had 14 million participants. How in the world do you get that number of participants? Well, it was actually, believe it or not, a redesign of Paris. In 1973, my group at the university was commissioned by the government of France, working under the leadership of the then Secretary of Education in France, who was Mitterrand, later became the president, she scarred the Stang, was president at the time, to do an idealized redesign of Paris. Now, we knew that no design of Paris could be implemented without the support of the public. So when the first design was prepared by a group of about 25 people, together, uh, university plus members of the cabinet, it was published in the press and put on television, and comments were invited. They came in in droves. Those comments were incorporated into a revised version of the design and published again. That went through four iterations. And in that process, we'd heard from 14 million people. In the United States, when Eisenhower was president, he commissioned a study on the scientific communication and technology transfer system. That was done again by a relatively small group of representatives then circulated in the scientific community, and we had two million people participate in that one. So the actual physical design may be done by a small group, but the opportunity to have a role in it can be enlarged to a population of any size. Because people will not support the implementation of a design that they don't feel ownership of. And they can only feel ownership if they have a say in it. And the beautiful thing about this process is there's no limit to the number of people you can have involved in the preparation of the design. Where should this process be begun? I'm asked this question all the time. The answer is so obvious, it hurts. Wherever you are. There is never a better place to initiate anything than where you are trying to say that I don't have the power as somebody else's responsibility is passing the buck. And when you pass the buck, 
you become a paralyzed organization. Many years ago, I was doing work in the Ford Motor Company when the, one of the executive vice presidents came to me and he said, we would like to do a two-day course with the top 200 executives of Ford Motor Company on systems thinking. Would you be willing to give such a course? He said, sure, I'd be delighted. He said, here's the way I want to do it. He said, I want to give 10 different uh, groups, each with 20 in it, so there are plenty of time and opportunity for discussion. It'll be a two-day course. So it means you have to run it 10 times. Is that okay? Yeah. He said, it turns out it works out perfectly. If we have four courses of 20 each, that will cover the junior vice presidents. That'll come first. Then three courses of the intermediate vice presidents. That comes next. Then two courses of the senior vice presidents. And then one of the executive office. Ten courses, 20 each, 200. And so we took off. In the first course, at the end when it was time for discussion, the first question was this. They said, or statement that was made. Russ, this stuff is great. All idealizing, I'd love to do it, but you're talking to the wrong people. I can't initiate this without the approval of my boss. Are you going to get a chance to show this to them? I said, yes. As a matter of fact, after we finish these first four courses, your boss will be in the next three. He said, great. He said, I'm going to find out when that course is run. I'm going to be waiting outside the door. When he comes out, I'm going to get his permission to go ahead. Now, the same question was asked in each of the first four sessions. So now we get up to the middle level vice president. What was the first question they asked? Same question. You're talking to the wrong people. You've got to talk to the senior VPs. We can't act without their approval. When we got there, what happened? Same thing. You're talking to the wrong people. You've got to talk to the CEO and the executive office. Without their approval, we can't start something as fundamental as this. Now, at this point, I was dying of curiosity. What in the world was going to happen when we gave the last session to the executive office? R.J. Miller was then the CEO of Ford. You may know him. He later became the dean of the business school at Stanford University after he retired. He asked the first question. He said, Russ, this stuff is great. I really want to do it, but I can't do it without the support of my subordinates. Are you going to get a chance to show this to them? <laughs> You see, that's a company that operates on the principle of cover your ass, and that's paralyzing. There is never a better place to start than where you are. Because if you do and you succeed, it will start contagion. And I give you example after example. Let me just give you one. Eastman Kodak, a sixth level manager, Henry Fenn, had a small computing center that served corporate headquarters. Now, Kodak had three computing centers, two very large ones, the largest ones serving the film business, the other one the apparatus business. These are the ones that make cameras and lenses, x-ray equipment, and all the other stuff. They were big, but the little one serving headquarters, about 150 people with some powerful equipment. Henry Fenn did a study of this sort, and when they got this vision, they can transform themselves. And they were noticeably improved in performance so that people all over the corporation were aware that something fundamental had happened. But Henry went on and did something else. He took the same group that had redesigned his department and said, suppose we could go out one level in the organization and redesign our environment. What would we do? And they come out with the answer they would integrate the three computing centers. And they put this in a paper, which they distributed. The head of the other two computing centers read this paper and said, you know, it makes a certain amount of sense. Let's form a joint group and redesign computing for Eastman Kodak, starting from scratch, assuming the three units are destroyed, which they did. And they came up with the design of a single computing center for Eastman Kodak, which they proposed to management and accepted. And Henry Fenton was made the director of that computing center. Now, telecommunications was organized the same way as computing, three units, headquarters, film, and apparatus. Seeing what had happened in computing, they went through the same process and came out with a corporate telecommunications center. Then what happened? The telecommunications center and the computing center got together and did a redesign of technology at Eastman Kodak 
and came out with a unified corporate technology center, which was accepted by top management and the event was made the director of it. Now it sounds like the end of a fairy tale, but it wasn't. Because Henry found out he could not hire the level of competency required to do the incredibly complex job of a center for Eastman Kodak. Why not? Well, the top computing and telecommunication people didn't want to work at Kodak because there was no opportunity for vertical movement. You're not going to become an executive at Eastman Kodak if you don't know film or film apparatus, not by knowing a computer. So that was the central problem. They brought the design group together and said, now we're going to design this thing again over from scratch. And they came out with an exciting idea, a joint venture. And so they went into a joint venture with IBM and DEC, built buildings on their campus and moved these activities into the joint venture so that all the employees doing computing and telecommunication now were employees of IBM or DEC and had vertical movement opportunities. And in the process of doing this, reduced telecommunication and computing costs by 40%. So you see, where do you start? You start where you are. And then it will spread if you're successful. If you're unsuccessful, you'll probably be fired. But there is no way of conducting a bloodless revolution. If you're going to start something as fundamental as a transformation, from one age to another in an organization, you have to be willing to run the risks. Now, in our experience, it's been very rare that somebody who starts gets rejected. But it does happen. It's happened to me. I've been kicked out of three universities before I finally found one that would tolerate what I wanted to do. So it does happen. But in most cases, it spreads like contagion. Now, what's the effect of going through this design? The first thing it does is change your concept of what's possible. Why? Well, it took America's greatest philosopher to answer this question, Pogo. You all know who Pogo is? Pogo's a little comic book character, a little possum. And in one of the episodes, Pogo and his little friend, the little tiny pig, are walking along. And Pogo says, I think I'm going to take a walk. And the little pig says, where are you going to walk? Pogo said, I'm going to go to the woods. What are you going to do in the woods? He said, I'm going to hunt the enemy. And Pogo disappears into the woods. The little pig is sitting on the edge of the woods. And the next frame, Pogo comes out. Pig gets up and says, Pogo, did you find them? He says, yep. Who is they, says the pig. You remember Pogo's answer? They is us. You see, the principal obstruction between us and where we want to be is us, not they, them, it. They, them, and it are excuses we use for not doing what we ought to be doing. Now, the best example of this I've ever run across, believe it or not, is a middle-aged housewife in England. A wonderful woman, her name was Madge. I have some old high school, an old high school buddy who was in World War II in England, and he picked up a British gal who he later married, Pamela, and settled in England. They have a wonderful old flat right near the Marble Arch. It's an old Victorian building with two flats per floor, five stories high. It's big, and so it's always a place I can stay when I go to London. The other flat on the floor is occupied by a family, and they've both been there over 35 years, so they're not, it's really one extended family. The doors are open and people move back and forth between them. The kids grew up together, as you could imagine. I was sitting in the living room with my host and hostess one day when Madge, the next door neighbor, came in, hopping angry. She said, you know what that damn Marks and Spencers did to me today? Now, for you, those of you who don't know England, Marks and Spencers is the largest retail chain in the world. They originally started with dry goods, but now they cover everything. It's a small department store. It's a little bit like a mini Sears. And on almost every corner of England and Canada, and uh, and they're right around the corner from this family's house. For those of you who know London, I'm talking about Edgware Road and Marlebourne, where they meet. There's a big Marks and Spencers, and it's right around the corner. Is this place called Transept Street, where my friend lived. 
He said, I got there this morning, as I do every morning, to cash a check so I could do my shopping. Because in those days, there was very little refrigeration in England. And the women had to do their shopping almost every day to have fresh food. He said, I got there this morning to cash a check, and they told me they have a new policy. They won't cash checks anymore. Now, my bank, Barclays, is four blocks down Edgware Road. It means I'd have to walk eight blocks before I could do my shopping. She said, that's intolerable. And then she stopped, and she got a little smile on her face. She said, I got them. She said, what did you do, Madge? She said, I stopped to think. I asked myself the following question. Is there any place in Marks and Spencer's where they dispense money? Well, they won't do it at the cash checking place, but is there any other place? You see, she's going to start at the end. She said, yes, there is, where we return goods. Ah. She went down and bought a dress, paid for it by check, took it to the return department, and got a cash refund. <laughs> Where was the obstruction? You see, you can look at it both ways. You can say the damn store's policy was an obstruction. Or you can say it's my conception of what is possible. Because it became perfectly possible for her to get cash in that system. When she started with where she wanted to be and worked backwards, I'm going to come back to that point again. There's a huge difference between starting from where you are and say, where do I want to go and how do I get there? And saying, where would I be ideally and how do I get from there back to where I am? I'm going to come back to that point later. But this process of idealizing makes you aware of the fact that when you start with the idea and look backwards, that you see yourself as the principal obstruction to getting where you want to go. I, I had a very interesting one recently working uh, with people in the railroad and shipping business. They said the principal problem in our business is the multiple handling of freight. The movement of freight from one place to another doesn't cost much. You see, you've got to first put it on a truck, you take it to the railroad, load it on the railroad, the railroad goes to another location, you load it to a truck, truck takes it to a ship, Ship takes it the other side of track, and you have all these handlings. Wouldn't it be marvelous if you could send from A to B without any handling? And they said, but you can't do it. I said, why can't you? He said, well, you're starting with what you got, these instruments that we have. There's no way of going from New York to Tokyo without handling. So, well, suppose the current system didn't exist, and you start over again. And they immediately came out with two ways of doing it. How could you go from New York to Tokyo without multiple handlings? Hmm? See, it's very difficult starting from where you are. If I start at the other end, there are two ways of doing it. One is a missile, right? A missile will go from New York to Tokyo without stopping. And so there's a the possibility of shipping freight through missiles. And the second way is pneumatic tubes which can go from one place to another without stopping. So that company is now exploring, on a limited basis initially, in, in a city, how to ship freight within a city by pneumatic tubes. And it can be done by incorporating them in a subway system that exists and so on. Things they never conceived of before become possible when you start at the other end and work backwards from where you would be ideally. You see possibilities that you otherwise would miss. Creativity. That's a big topic in management. Ever since Edward de Bono wrote his first little book called Straight and Lateral Thinking. Do you all know Edward de Bono? He's a, he was a young Englishman, was an instructor at Cambridge University, who married and watched his children grow and was amazed at the creativity of children. And so he got interested in the subject. And he said, how come children are so creative and adults are so dull? What happens? He never answered that question, but what he did do was develop ways of making adults more creative. The question, however, was answered by two people, an American anthropologist, Jules Henry, who wrote a book called Culture Against Man, and by a British psychiatrist, Ronald Lang, who was one of the cult heroes of the hippie movement. And they, said, they showed what, why creativity is killed 
in children. Because all through school, you're taught two things. When you were given an examination and you read the question, what's the first thing that went through your mind? Try to remember. It was not, what is the answer to the question? What was it? What answer do they expect? All through school, you were taught to provide the answers that they expect. I can't be creative precisely because it's expected. When I work in a corporation with anybody under the CEO, and we get together to work on a problem, the first question they ask me is, what does the boss expect? It's all ingrained in us. Creativity involves giving people something they don't expect. You see, we've learned something about creativity. It's a process in which there are three steps. First, it's the identification of an assumption that you make that constrains the number of alternatives you consider. It's the denial of that assumption and the exploration of the significance of that denial. 